Good day. I first need to start out, I, one of the problems with doing this course is sometimes I watch the films afterward. And uh, when I'm up late in the morning and need something to put me to sleep. But anyway, I was noticing that um, in one of the uh, classes a couple of times ago, I uh, kept using the wrong word for what I meant. You know, that happens when you get old or when you run for president. Anyway, I kept, uh, I was talking about the, the Platonic conception of God or the Neoplatonic conception of God. And uh, how that the one, as the, as the uh, title the one implies, is uh, an undifferentiated being. That is, uh, the one is being itself. It has no, um, it has no differentiations. Uh, in fact, I need to talk about that a little bit more in a kind of a uh, systematic way so that uh, we'll understand that when we get to our study of the differences uh, in Christian ethics. But when I was discussing that, I'll do that in just a second, but when I was discussing that, I kept saying that the one was impassionate. I don't know whether any of you noticed uh, that that was a misuse of words because what I was trying to say is that the one is impassive. Now, do you know the difference between being impassionate and being impassive? Well, to say that the one was impassionate is to say the opposite of what I have meant to say because impassionate uh, talks about being really passionate. And uh, what I was trying to say is that the one is impassive, that is, it does not have passions. Uh, it does not suffer. It does not feel. Especially it doesn't have any negative feelings of, uh, of uh, grief or suffering. And so in order to understand how Neoplatonism has impacted on the history of Christian thought, we need to understand that the, that the biblical view of God uh, is strikingly different from the Neoplatonic view of the impassivity of the one. Because the biblical view of God, the, the one, is not interested in reaching out to human beings. The one is, uh, has not personally and deliberately created human beings. And so there's no real there's no real attraction of the one to human beings. Uh, human beings, insofar as they are spirits or souls, are attracted to the one. But that's not because the one has a personal relationship with human beings. That's because the spirit or the soul inside the human being is a part of the one, is a part of God that has been broken off and trapped inside a body. And uh, so the story of the biblical God is the story of personal reaching out. First of all, it's the story of a personal creation of human beings to be persons in the image of God and therefore to be, uh, to be persons who have the possibility of relationship with their creator. Well, that's, uh, that, as the word implies, is a, very, is a very personal view of God, a view of God as person. Now, obviously, if you want to get philosophical, you'll have to talk in terms of God being supra-personal or more than personal, because when we use the word person, we're just using it, in a sense, kind of by analogy, because we know what a person is in human terms, and so we want to talk about God as being personal, not arbitrarily, but from the perspective of Jews and Christians, because that is the way God has presented himself to us as personal. So the, both the religion of the Old Testament, Judaism, and the religion of the New Testament, Christianity, are covenant faiths. That is, they're faiths in which 
God has made a agreement or a covenant contract with his people and they are in covenant relationship with him. So that's very personal. Uh, the other night on, um, I believe it's Channel 8, they replayed an old film called Green Pastures. Any of you ever heard of that film? It was a film put out in the 30s. It was an all-black ca cast. It was one of the uh, first uh, movies with an all-black cast that was uh, shown in very many theaters. And it was basically a story of the history of the Bible and the history of the relationship between God and his people told from a, a kind of a, a mid-30s uh, black perspective. It, in fact, uh, it's really not very politically correct these days because they, um, they uh, show God and, uh, and black religion uh, in a not very sophisticated light. But one of the things that was very important in this Green Pastures film or story is that it does bring out in bold uh, in bold detail, the general Christian conception of the personality of God. And uh, it also brought out, uh, like some more recent books like The Story of God or The History of God have done, that our perception of God has changed over the centuries. Uh, that is, the people of the Bible's perception of God has changed over the centuries. And they particularly mentioned the prophecies of Hosea as uh, giving, a, giving a softer image of God, an image of God that uh, is more compatible with the idea of grace and mercy and so forth. But the story of Amos also tells us something, even though it doesn't use this language, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't say God is a suffering God as a kind of a philosophical principle. It does tell us about what God's relationship is to his people from the perspective of Hosea and the other prophets. That is, he is a, he is a, uh, he is someone who has a, uh, a covenant relationship with his people. So when they hurt, he hurts. When they do things that hurt themselves, he grieves. Well, uh, you have this language all through the Bible, how that God grieves and God suffers and God hurts and God is, uh, God is uh, depressed over the way his people are acting. Well, you can call that language anthropomorphic if you want to. That is that you're using human, you're, you're, try, you're kind of changing God into a human being. But from the biblical perspective, you're actually doing something different. You're actually... Uh, trying to understand God in analogy uh, to the human being. The highest possibility for human beings is love. We have a little bit of an understanding about what love is because of our own experiences. And so we have then a category or a, or a peg, as we talked about a couple of times ago, we have a peg to hang something on so we can think of God as love by which we don't mean that his love is exactly like the love that I experience, but it is similar to it, except that God is love with a capital L. God's love transcends anything that we can experience or anything we can feel or, or hope for. But at the same time, uh, it is not something that, is, that, that we can't talk about. We can talk about it by using the language of love. And in the same way, if God is personal and we can talk about him uh, with the use of personal language, we can also think of him, if he really loves, as also grieving. Because that's the way our love is experienced. If you haven't had any grief because of your love, then you haven't had teenagers yet. What you have to understand is that to love in a covenantal committed sense means that you're going to experience some grief and uh, the Old Testament conception of human beings being the children of God being the creation of God 
means that he he is not uh, he is not guilty of the sin and of the corruption and of the evil that human beings do, but he voluntarily, in a sense, takes responsibility for it, and he takes responsibility for for the ultimate redemption of human beings. So it makes him sad, it makes him angry, it makes him grieve when human beings are not what they're supposed to be. Now the Greeks could not imagine the supreme God being itself, being this passionate. And so they talked about him being impassive. And that's one of the reasons why I said that it's important to understand that as Christianity moved into these Greek thinking areas, uh, the the uh, discussion and the study and the the interpretation of the biblical story in the light of Greek ideas was almost inevitable, but it also it also has some dangers in that it can change the entire basis of a. Uh, of understanding the character of God from the biblical perspective. Now let me uh, just give you a, a kind of a bird's eye view of the ne Neoplatonic conception of God and how it relates to human beings. Um, we're, we're in the middle of discussing the Reformation view of ethics. But in order to understand the reaction of the Reformation view of ethics to medieval ethics. You have to understand that the that medieval ethics uh, were largely dependent upon Aristotle and uh, the ethics of, uh, of the pre-medieval church were largely dependent upon Neoplatonism. So we need to understand a little bit about what Neoplatonism is. We talked about the one, O-N-E. The one is uh, the Neoplatonic corresponding idea for God. Only the word God can mean lots of different things. The word God in the Bible, of course, uh, for instance, can refer to all of the different things that are worshipped in the ancient world. The word God can refer to the mythological beings who are the personifications of natural processes, or it can also uh, refer to the one who is not the personification of natural processes, but is actually the creator of natural processes. So you can use the word God in a very wide, uh, very wide way. And so, even though uh, in ordinary conversation a Neoplatonist or a Stoic would use the word God, if they were talking in more technical terms, a Neoplatonist would talk about the One. The One transcends everything. Uh, there is no differentiation. Uh, another way of talking about the one is that the one is the good. There, are, there is a hierarchy of good or a hierarchy of being. And uh, if we want to understand what is the source of that hierarchy of good, we have to understand that the one is the source of that. Another way of talking about the one is being itself. Everything that is participates in being, but the one is being itself. Everything that exists stands outside of the being of being itself. If it didn't stand outside of being itself, it would not exist. Well, what has this one got to do with me? Well, the Neoplatonist explains that there is an emanation from the one. Uh, if you want to comprehend emanation, uh, you have to imagine uh, when you were blowing bubbles. <laughs> you have a bubble and then emanating from that bubble, if you're still blowing, might come another one that's attached. And so there is an emanation from the one. Now, Platonism really doesn't explain why this emanation takes place. It just uses it to describe 
what has taken place. And so t uh, emanating from the one is the noose or the mind. And in Platonism, and uh, and uh, you'll remember if you uh, if you remember the quote from the New Testament, in the beginning was the Logos. The Logos is also uh, a concept which is closely related to the idea of mind or the idea of nous in the Greek. Now it's in the mind that differentiations first start to appear. Now this, this may be kind of uh, burdensome, <laughs> all of this discussion, but it's really important to understand uh, how to differentiate between the Hebrew and the Christian understanding of creation and human beings and the Greek understanding. Out of the, uh, in the noose come the first differentiations. But these differentiations are ideas. There's nothing real yet. There's, there are only ideas. For instance, in the mind or in the noose, there's the ideal horse. But there's still no horse. Why isn't there a horse? Because one of the things horses are made of is matter. Well, where is matter? Well, you have to look very far down the road, according to Neoplatonism, to find matter, to spy matter. Because matter has nothing whatever to do with the one. Because the one is being itself, and matter is non-being. Now, if you, uh, if you follow, this, this will turn out to be kind of rational, that is, uh, whether you agree with this way of looking at the world or not, it still has, it still follows a, it still has a rationality and a logic to it. So from the perspective of Neoplatonism, matter is non-being, which means if the one is the good, what is matter? The matter is evil. The matter is as far away from the good and as far away from God as you can get. And so the one has no interest in matter. But again, for some reason, and again, Neoplatonism does not explain why, but for some reason there is an emanation from the noose or from the mind that picks up matter. And that emanation is the soul with a capital L, uh, with a capital S soul. Everything from the Neoplatonic perspective has soul. This desk has soul, a vegetable has soul, a, uh, an animal has soul, a human being has soul. But all of these things are also characterized by participating in matter. So when real things occur, what is happening is that being is participating in matter, matter is participating in being. Now this creates a hierarchy of being because different things have different levels or amounts of soul. Now I hope you can recognize this as a, as a, as a vast oversimplification of Neoplatonism but it's important to kind of get a picture so we'll know what we're contrasting. A hierarchy of being is created when soul begins to pick up matter, and soul gives form to matter. If, if, if it weren't for soul, matter would not have any form. Well, what is the lowest participation of soul in matter. In other words, um, in what part of reality is a thing mostly matter and less soul? Well, you just follow the, follow the being of matter. Uh, uh, material objects, stones, minerals, they have soul, but they don't have much soul. 
They only have a soul, enough soul to, in a sense, appear in reality. But if you go up the hierarchical scale, you get the vegetables, and vegetables have more soul and less matter. They're still primarily matter. And then you go to the scale on the scale of the hierarchy of being of animals, and some animals have less soul and more matter than others, and so forth. And uh, for people in the ancient world, uh, what animal would you say had the most soul besides human beings? What? Cats. Cats? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Cats. Well, that's true, and the, and the highest amount of soul belonged to the lion. Now, that's an interesting uh, answer because I don't know where you got it, but when I ask that question, usually people say monkeys or apes. And the reason why they say that is because we live after Darwin. So for us, the hierarchy of being is a kind of a biological hierarchy of being that has to do with evolution. But, uh, but the hierarchy of being in the ancient world has to do with soul, that is, what, is more, what has more soul. And when you, start, when you start with human beings, different human beings uh, participate more heavily in soul than they do uh, uh, than matter, and other human beings participate more heavily in matter than they do soul. Yes? Oh, wouldn't it be logical to say that animals that love um, have more soul than the ones that don't, say like snakes? Well, <laughs> yeah, there all, are all, they're all kinds of logic here. And, uh, and uh, there's no doubt that, uh, that a Neoplatonist would uh, put a snake on the lower level of the hierarchy of being than, than some other animals. Yeah. And uh, human beings also appear at different levels on this hierarchy of being. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, who would be kind of on the lowest rung of the ladder of the hierarchy of being among human beings? Now, remember when you give this answer that this is not my opinion. Of course, females would be on the on the lower ring of the ladder, and uh, and uh, that's the reason why Neoplatonists and Manichees and all of these kind of people uh, kind of have a little philosophical problem with with uh, somebody being female, and this carries over even to uh, some medieval thought, because uh, Aristotle believed that a female was a misformed male. In other words, uh, nature was trying to produce a male, but something went wrong. Well, that obviously is the incorporation into a philosophical system of a cultural prejudice. But it's still very important for understanding uh, a lot of the thought that uh, developed in the medieval period about females, because no matter how no matter how oppressed and secondary um, and uh, hierarchically inferior women were in the Hebrew and the biblical idea, uh, they still didn't have the philosophical character of being lowest on the hierarchy of being. Uh, in other words, there was, there was still more of, a, of an equality of male and female in the old Hebrew thought because male and female were the creation of God, and they were both the creation of God uh, made in the image of God. So, um, not, only, not only does the philosophical understanding of the nature of human beings depend upon, in the Middle Ages and in later Christianity, depend upon how influential Neoplatonism and Manichaeism has been, as we've already illustrated in Augustine. But also the ethical views. Ethics depends on what you believe about these things. If you believe that matter is evil, and that the more, and the fact that human beings participate in matter is the source of their fall, then 
redemption will be in some way to escape matter and to go back into union with the one. And if you escape matter and go back into union with the one, which is the ultimate goal, Neoplatonism is a religious philosophy. It's only been very recently that anybody has developed a philosophy that they would not consider religious. Philosophies uh, in, the, in, in the world until just recently have been religious philosophies. So the religious philosophy of Neoplatonism looks forward to a kind of redemption, that is the redemption from matter. Now, let's, uh, let's look, that, look at that uh, using a, kind of another scale. If, you, uh, if you're doing Christian ethics, then there are several very basic concepts which go into your vision of what Christian ethics is. One of those is the concept of creation. And you get this concept throughout the Bible, but uh, obviously the Bible begins with this concept in the book of Genesis, in chapters 1 and 2, when it talks about how human beings are the creation of God. And uh, after each act of creation, according to Genesis 1, God says what? That's good. Now, that means that from the biblical perspective, matter is not the opposite of God. Matter is the creation of God. In contrast even to the Babylonian mythologies that the book of Genesis is reacting to. If you, if you want to understand the book of Genesis, you need to understand that the book of Genesis is written in reaction to some stories of the nature of human beings and of God that already existed. When Abraham, for instance, was called, Abraham was not a Jew, he was not an Israelite. He was a, uh, an Aramaean who lived in what is now Iraq. And so when Abraham was called, uh, you need to understand that he was not a Jew, he was not an Israelite, he was probably not, he was not a monotheist. He was probably someone who had been raised on the mythological stories of the gods. And the Babylonian mythology of the gods, uh, chaos, the great mother goddess, is the source of all being. And so the story of creation, actually the word creation is misused when it's referring to the Babylonian myth because the Babylonian myth is a myth of generation or emanation rather than a myth of creation. But in the old Babylonian myth, everything begins with the great mother goddess of chaos. And out of the mother goddess of chaos comes everything ultimately both human beings and the gods. So in, in Babylonian mythology, the gods and human beings are made out of the same stuff. So Genesis 1 is written in, in reaction to and even in contrast to the Babylonian myth out of which the people of Israel had come culturally. So uh, some scholars talk about Genesis 1 as being a demythologizing work of literature. That is, it demythologizes the ancient myths. And two important ways in which it demythologizes the ancient myths is that in Genesis 1, or in the Babylonian myth, chaos is kind of the ultimate source of everything. In Genesis 1, chaos itself is the creation of God. And then it's out of chaos that God builds everything. But creation and God are not the same. Creation and God are different. So in, so in Hebrew thought, you have to keep in mind, if you understand the doctrine of creation, the absolute difference between the creator and the creation. They're not the same thing. Human beings have never been God. They are not God now, and they, were ne they will never be God. 
But in Neoplatonic thought, the only important part of human beings is God. In other words, the human soul is immortal because the human soul is divine. It's a part of God that has been broken off and has, and has been entrapped in matter. So, if you're going to look at uh, the Hebrew Christian understanding of creation, and then you're going to contrast it with Neoplatonism or Manichaeism or Gnosticism, you have to understand that in the Hebrew Christian view of creation, uh, creation is good. Whereas in the Manichaean or in the Gnostic or uh, to a lesser extent but still true in the Neoplatonic scheme, creation is not good. Well, that's going to have a tremendous impact on ethics because in ethics you're trying to find out what is the good? The second traditional Christian concept which is important for understanding the story of the Bible and therefore the story of God and the story of human beings and, and also the basis for ethical understanding of the nature of God and man is the fall. Now, if you believe, as the Hebrews did, that creation is good, then what would you think the fall would be? You could put it in different, several different ways. You can say that the fall is the distortion of creation. Or that the fall is the corruption of creation. But now you're looking at creation or nature or things from the perspective of a Gnostic or a Manichae or a Neoplatonist. What is the fall? Hmm? Okay, the fall is creation itself. Creation is the fall. The fact that you have a body is the fall in all of these worldviews. Well, that means that uh, when you come to the problem of salvation or redemption, which again is another biblical word, but we're using it uh, to kind of uh, uh, classify these things in a way that we can understand the differences. When you come to redemption then, the Hebrew Christian view would be that redemption is the redemption of what? If creation is good and the fall or sin is simply the distortion or the corruption of creation, then redemption would be the redemption of creation. Now we're going to use two words here, and they are small words, but they mean all they have all the difference in the world in meaning. Because for uh, for a world for a worldview or a vision that believes that creation is good, and that the fall and that sin and that all of the problems of the world result from the corruption or the distortion of creation, then that means redemption means the redemption of creation. So the biblical view is that creation was the idea of God. It was a deliberate act. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an unfortunate event. And that the fall of creation was the unfortunate event. And therefore, the redemption or the salvation of that which God has created is the ultimate goal, the redemption of creation. So if you look at the prophets or if you look at the uh, early New Testament literature, 
you have the you have the uh, concept of the or you have the picture of the peaceable kingdom where the lion where the wolf lies down with the lamb and so forth and the and the little child uh steps on a snake and it doesn't hurt him and so forth so you have you have these uh, very imaginative pictures of the redemption of creation i have a collection of uh, of paintings by hick which are called the peaceable kingdom. And I don't remember how many he painted, 70 or 80. But uh, they're all pictures of this uh, I, image from Isaiah of the wolf lying down with the lamb, the, the lion lying down with the lamb. And uh, a, a lot of these pictures have to do with uh, William Penn in Pennsylvania because uh, William Penn was a pacifist and, and uh, Christian ethics worked in Pennsylvania more thoroughly and for a longer time probably than any other time in history because there was a period of about 70 years after William Penn established Pennsylvania as a kind of a Quaker community. There was a period of about 70 years when uh, as far as we can tell there was no hostile action between white people and Native Americans and that was the longest period in history in which there hadn't been that kind of war. You know, there had been wars in Europe continuously. But in this, little, uh, in this little section of the world called Pennsylvania, where William Penn and his Quakers had influence, you had the longest period of peace. And this is what uh, Hicks is, uh, is painting. Because from his perspective, that period of peace, that peaceable kingdom that Pennsylvania kind of uh, represented. Now, it, it wasn't perfect, but uh, uh, Pennsylvanians didn't start mistreating Native Americans until uh, us Irish showed up in Pennsylvania <laughs> because the Quakers were doing a pretty good job. Uh, so the peaceable kingdom uh, is very important in the in the Old Testament prophets. And then in the New Testament, you have the concept of the redemption of creation in Romans chapter 8, where Paul describes creation itself kind of standing on tiptoes, looking forward to, the, to its own redemption, because the creation itself will be redeemed. And then you have in the last chapters of the book of Revelation, the idea of the new heavens and the new earth. And uh, Paul also talks about... Uh, being redeemed, being a new creation. That's also the uh, idea to which this concept of the new birth is related, though the word, the idea of the new birth is used in uh, probably slightly different ways from the way the New Testament uses it these days. But anyway, all of those images are the image that are images of the fact that God has created human beings and he has not given them up. And not only has he not given up human beings, but he has not given up his whole creation. In other words, from the biblical perspective, the creation does not belong to the devil, if you want to put it in those terms. The creation belongs to God. The devil, so to speak, has control over it. And human beings are messing it up and corrupting it and distorting it. But God, and God is grieved about that. But that doesn't mean he's given up. From the biblical perspective, God is working full time to get his creation back, to redeem his creation, and to bring it back into fellowship with him. So redemption is the redemption of creation. However, if you start with the idea that creation is not good because creation itself is the fall, um, one of the ways this is put is uh, sometimes the biblical fall is called the historical fall. That is, that the fall in the Bible occurs after creation and is not caused by creation. Whereas the Neoplatonic concept of the fall is the transcendent fall. That is, the fall is the fall from the transcendent one into contamination by matter. So the fact that you exist 
is evidence of the fall. That's not true in, uh, in biblical thought. In biblical thought, the only evidence of the fall is the way you act and the way you, uh, and the way you uh, hurt people and the, and the way you distort the original reason for God's creation. So you are not evil because you're an individual human being. And you're not evil, your body is not evil. Your body is you, the, your body is part of you. It's an essential part of you. From the biblical perspective, you can't be you without a body. That's the reason why the redemption of creation is also put in symbolic terms as the redemption of the body or the resurrection from the dead or the resurrection of the body. Now, can you see how these different views will affect ethics? Because from the perspective of the Manichees, from the perspective of the Gnostics, and to a certain extent from the perspective of the Neoplatonists, redemption is the redemption from creation. Now I want to I want to reiterate this obviously is an oversimplification and if you want to understand if you want to understand uh, Neoplatonism better you need to do some more reading but this is a simplification uh, for purposes of our trying to get into our minds why Christianity has taken such a uh, kind of a schizophrenic stand in its history about the goodness or the badness of creation or the goodness or the badness of history or the goodness or the badness of the human body or the goodness or the badness of sexuality or the goodness in, or the badness of wealth. That's because this, this uh, split personality, schizophrenia is not really the right word, this kind of split personality comes from the fact that these two almost opposite views of the nature of reality have been intertwined in the history of Christianity. And so lots of theologians have not really been clear in their own mind about whether creation is good and God wants to redeem creation or whether creation is not good and God wants to redeem us from creation. And there are religious traditions Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant of all kinds that uh, sometimes tip the scale against creation as though God were only interested in saving individual immortal souls and he was not interested in saving the whole of creation, redeeming the whole of creation. That's one of the, that's one of the gripes that, that a number of modern theologians and uh, anti-theologians have about the impact or the effect of Christianity, for instance, on the modern ecological crisis. That is, um, if you understand the history of the ecological crisis, you'll understand that uh, the ecological crisis is really kind of a recent development. There have been ecological crises in the past that have been brought about by natural events. But the ecological crisis of recent development is an ecological crisis that's been brought about by the failure of human, of ethics in human society, in human culture. Uh, it was impossible for people not too long ago to pollute the world the way it's possible for us to pollute the world. So a lot of people have said, well, the, the cause for this pollution is the biblical view of creation. That is, according to the Bible, human beings have been given charge over creation and they haven't done a very good job of it. Well, there's no doubt that, that in Genesis, human beings are given charge over creation in a sense. That is, they're, they're made stewards of creation. But uh, that reality, uh, which is not just a guess, it's, uh, if, you, if you look at human history, you can see that human beings have, have gained control over nature. 
Now, that's not just a religious idea. That's an empirical observation that human beings are, have gained control over nature. The question is, are, are human beings doing that in an ethical way? So not only does the, uh, does the biblical view of the relationship between human beings and nature uh, sometimes uh, create a problem if human beings think that they own nature and that they can do whatever they want to with nature. The biblical view of creation can also be the solution to the ecological problem because the biblical view is that human beings do not own nature. They do not own creation. They are a part of nature and creation. Human beings are made out of the same stuff that other animals are made out of. Human beings are made out of the same stuff that the universe is made out of. So human beings are not transcendent, immortal souls that, have, that, have, that are superior to creation. Human beings are a part of creation. And therefore, they should be properly related to creation. So um, there's, uh, the, the problem I'm pointing out is that people have been correct in saying that for, for some time now, Christianity has been remiss in in developing its ecological ethics. But there is certainly a basis for ecological ethics in the biblical understanding of the goodness of creation. That has been, that has been overshadowed by the impact of Manichaeism and Neoplatonism and these other, and Gnosticism, uh, in which human beings as, you, as individual bodily human beings are not good and the creation is not good. And so in a religion in which creation is not good, you will probably not gain much control over nature because modern science is, uh, is kind of based on the assumption that creation is good and that creation is not God and can be studied separate and apart from itself, from, from the study of God. And so if you don't have this biblical understanding of uh, creation, then uh, you have no basis in your culture for the development of modern science. And if you have no development of modern science, you have no basis for the development of modern technology. But developing the fact that, the fact that nations who have been influenced by the biblical view of creation have created modern science and technology does not necessarily mean that they have been ethical in their use of technology. It's obvious they haven't been. But there is, there is possibility there. If you believe that, that the body is evil and that creation is evil, there's really no possibility there of developing an ecological ethic. That's one of the interesting things about a great deal of... of uh, uh, inter American interest in, uh, in Eastern spirituality. Now, it's not the purpose of this course to judge, you know, whether Eastern spirituality or Western spirituality is, quote, the truth. But we can, we can uh, decide whether Eastern spirituality or Western spirituality has uh, resources for the development of, of a positive view of nature. And so it was interesting when I was at Rice, I taught a course in ethics at Rice, and there was this. Uh, there were these two girls who came into class, and they were dressed in saffron robes, and uh, and so it was interesting. So I asked them uh, what what this meant, and they said, "Well, uh, we are Buddhists, which is wonderful. You know, we have freedom of religion at Rice." We are Buddhists. And I said, well, that's interesting because they were obviously not Oriental. Uh, they were obviously Americans, had Texas accents. So I said, how did you become Buddhists? And they said, well, we were Baptists. But he said, but she said, uh, we've decided to stop and smell the roses. Well, that kind of ended that conversation because I didn't know where to go from, from that. But the, uh, the point I would have made with them if I had uh, carried on the conversation more is that 
the, that the reason why they were interested in stopping and smelling the roses was probably more because they were raised Baptists than Buddhists. Because Buddhists, a lot of Buddhists in Japan, for instance, are wonderful gardeners and they have wonderful gardens and beautiful roses and all this kind of thing. But a Buddhist who has a garden and who pays a great deal of attention to the, to the sensual pleasures of this world is really not expecting to be redeemed very quickly. The Buddhists who are expecting to be redeemed are who? The monks who separate themselves from sensual enjoyment and sensual life and marriage and sex and so forth. These are the folks who believe that they finally come to the point where they're going to get serious about this and, uh, and uh, be redeemed or saved from creation. Uh, because if you're saved from creation, that means you're saved from suffering. And that's the ultimate goal in Buddhism, is to be saved from suffering. And so I know I have some friends, uh, some of them who teach in town, who were raised uh, Christians, but they became Buddhists because they assumed that being a Buddhist would give them a, a better ecological ethic. But after they become Buddhists, they realize that there is no ecological ethics in Buddhism. That you're, not, that, you're, that you're wrong in expecting an ecological ethic in Buddhism. Now that doesn't mean that uh, Buddhists can't be ethologically, ecologically ethical, but that does not arise out of the Buddhist theology or the Buddhist philosophy. Because the Buddhist philosophy considers, uh, and Hindu philosophy, considers what we call creation to be maya, which means illusion. And that may be correct. A lot of Americans are coming to that conclusion. But that is different from the biblical understanding that creation is good. So your ethics, your ethics arising out of that will be different. Ethics arising out of the creation not being good will tend to be ascetic ethics. Ascetic Which means what? What is an ascetic? You, if, if you've uh, watched TV in the last few weeks, there have been, what, 78 million people at one gathering in India recently. That was to bathe in the conjunction of the Ganges River and... and and uh, another river, and then a mythological river. And they go down to bathe. And, and if, you, if the camera swings across these 78 million people, lots of them are, are ascetics. That is, they have given up ordinary life, and they're trying to live in such a way that they will become totally detached from ordinary life, totally detached from their families, totally detached from their... Uh, from any uh, earthly pleasures or enjoyment because from their perspective, and this is a very uh, substantial and uh, profound perspective, the only way to be redeemed is to do that, is to detach yourself from everything that has meaning for ordinary unthinking people. And so uh, the ethics of... Uh, that creation is not good, tend toward asceticism. Now there's been, there's been asceticism, in some asceticism in Judaism and some asceticism in Christianity. But just like mysticism, it's not the same thing. In other words, in Christianity and Judaism, for instance, you might have fast days, or you might fast, or you might give up sex for a while. There are all kinds of, these kind of events that you see throughout the Old Testament. But you don't give up sex in Judaism or in Christianity because sex is evil. And participating in sex will, will hinder your being holy or being redeemed. You may give it up for some other reason. That's the reason why uh, you cannot say that Judaism and Christianity are really ascetic ex ethics. Christianity and Judaism are world-affirming ethics. 
world affirming. That is, Christians and Jews should act in the world as if the world is good and everybody deserves to be able to participate in it. Not that the world is evil and that in order to be holy you don't want to participate in it at all. That is a highly individualistic ethic. That is, I'm going to detach myself from the world and therefore I'm going to get myself in good enough shape to escape the world. Whereas uh, Jew Jewish and Christian ethics are social ethics. That is, they are world-affirming ethics. If I give up, if I, if I uh, give up some of my wealth, that is, I, I decide not to be a conspicuous consumer, decide to set aside some of my wealth to help somebody else. It's not because their being wealthy is evil. If, that's, if that were true, then it would be a sin for me to give them any help. It's that, it's that they deserve the necessities of life just as much as I do. And if I am hoarding what to them are necessities just for you know, use on my own extravagance and excess, then uh, that's where ethics comes into play in Christianity. So you don't give up uh, a good meal because it's evil to enjoy good food. You might give up a good meal because it's good and someone else deserves to enjoy it too. So I hope this, uh, these kinds of... Uh, pictures give you a little bit better understanding of what kind of what kind of cultural uh, theological and ethical things kind of came into uh, collision in Europe and in Egypt and other places when Christianity moved into these areas there were already ascetic monks in Egypt before Christianity came there and basically what happened is that these ascetic monks were converted to Christianity it wasn't they became ascetic monks after they became Christians. The, uh, asceticism was converted to Christianity. And so asceticism became much more important in the, in the uh, virtue centuries and even through the Middle Ages in the church than it had been before. Now, that brings us back to Luther and Calvin. Because Luther and Calvin are not ascetics. Certainly, Luther was not an ascetic. Uh, Luther believed, after he, after he came to his uh, understanding of justification by faith, Luther believed that creation was good. Luther was asked one time, for instance, to define providence. And Luther's definition of providence was, providence means that God will not allow the devil to poison all the beer. Well, that's, that, Luther talked that way all the time, so a lot of very proper uh, religious people consider ethic to be a foul mouth because he said worse things than that. But uh, the, point, the point he was making was that, that he had a different concept now of human life and historical life and, uh, and uh, the goodness of creation. And uh, from his perspective, therefore, the church had been, had been unchristian, unbiblical to insist on celibacy as, for instance, as a higher state of holiness or to insist on monasticism as a higher state of holiness because from Luther's perspective everyone had a calling a vocation whereas in the Middle Ages what did it mean to have a calling In the Middle Ages, what it meant to have a calling is that you were called to the priesthood or to monasticism 
or something like that. In other words, calling uh, had a religious connotation. And from Luther's perspective, that was unbiblical because from the biblical perspective, all of the redeemed were saints and all of the redeemed were called. And so ordinary callings, vocations, became important. And Now, when I was going to school, they used to have uh, vocation day. I don't know if they still have those in high schools or junior highs, but they used to have vocation day. And what they meant was people from various kinds of businesses and professions were going to come to school and try to help you understand what was involved in these different professions. And they were called vocations. Well, vocation, in that sense, comes from Luther. Because in the medieval church, vocation meant to become a priest or a nun or a, or a monk. Whereas for Luther, vocation means to be a, uh, to be a farmer, to be a miner, uh, to be a, um, a mother, to be a father. Whatever we did, from Luther's perspective, was a vocation from God. And uh, God cannot use, from Luther's perspective, as many monks and priests <laughs> as the church had because God needed more good farmers to produce the kind of things that would help people. In other words... Christian ethics is the ethics of the whole of life. It's not just the ethics of a religious life. And the same thing was true of Calvin, though Calvin sometimes is given, is painted as though he were an ascetic and that he required asceticism from his people. He certainly required discipline from his people. In other words, uh, he didn't require sexual ascetics, for instance, because all Puritans, all Calvinists, were assumed to participate in sexuality. They were assumed, it was assumed that they would get married. In fact, that's, it's out of Puritanism that the idea kind of developed on the other extreme, that you're not really what you ought to be unless you're married. And that, of course, is an extreme. But uh, that certainly indicates that our that our picture of Puritanism or Calvinism is incorrect uh, if it is considered to be an asceticism of sexuality. Uh, we've already indicated that that certainly was true in a kind of a uh, uh, in a kind of a sick way uh, in a lot of Victorian thought. But uh, Victorians were not Puritans, and uh, uh, Puritans at the same time actually had kind of a healthier view of sexuality. The, um, the view of work in Puritanism was also very positive, again, because their ethic was world-affirming. That is, if you had a calling to work, you were working for God. You weren't working for Exxon or for, for, your, uh, for a farmer. You were working for God. And this is the basis upon which the pure, so-called Puritan work ethic developed. That is, uh, a Puritan work ethic is one that will ultimately result, on the whole, as, uh, as being more productive and being more disciplined and being more honest. Because the Puritan worker knew that he wasn't working for any human being. He was working for God. Therefore, there was not a time in which his boss was not looking. You know, if you want to know what the basis of the Puritan work ethic, that's it. There's not a time when, you're, when your boss is not looking because you're working for God. And you're working for God for, for two reasons. First, to take care of yourself and your own family. And then to have enough money to take care of other people who need your help. That's the reason why you're working for a Puritan, as a Puritan. Now, the Puritans were so successful, generally. Obviously, there, there are individual Puritans who were totally, total failures, <laughs> economically and otherwise. But generally, the Puritans were so successful, just like 
uh, comparable people today like the Mennonites and the Amish who have this same work ethic. They are so successful that they not only have enough money to take care of their families, they also have enough money to take care of other people in the community who need help, and they still have money left over after all of that. And this was the germ in America and England of what we call capitalism. Because what is left after you've taken care of your family and after you've taken care of, your, of other people in your community, what is left uh, is, is uh, just kind of lying around. You invest it. And so the Puritans were also the first Christian religious group to take the, take the uh, onus off of, of uh, money lending for interest. I mean, there was always money lending for interest even during the Middle Ages. But, it, but you may not be aware that lending money for interest during the Middle Ages was against church law. But the Puritans realized that they were so successful that they didn't need to lend money the way the prophets required them because they were already taking care of their family and they were already taking care of their community. And so they had money left over to lend to rich people. <laughs> in other words, to use in, in capital investments. And, uh, and uh, you can't explain the rise of English and American capitalism totally from Puritanism, but Puritanism certainly gives one of the important uh, injections into that not only in England and America, but in Holland, which was also Puritan, Calvinist. And in New York City, which was Calvinist. You know, New York City, Massachusetts was Puritan in the English sense of Calvinist, but New York City originated in the Dutch sense as, as Calvinist. And uh, a lot of famous uh, New Yorkers uh, since then, like, uh, Frank, Franklin Roosevelt were Dutch Calvinists originally. So um, your ethic, as in the sense of, quote, Puritan work ethic, then depends on whether you are ascetic in your ethics or whether you're world affirming in your ethics. And in countries where ethics are not, are ascetic and not world affirming, a country can have a tremendous amount of natural resources and yet their people be extremely poor. There are no, there are no more natural resources, for instance, in, uh, in Africa than there are in the United States. I mean, there are no more natural resources in the United States than there are in Africa. Let's get that straight before I have to look at the film. There are no more um, natural resources in America than there are in Africa. But the natural resources in Africa uh, are exploited in a very uh, corrupt way. And therefore, the wealth that should be produced by natural resources combined with an ethical, with an ethic of work have not provided wealth and substance to the people of Africa. And if you're going to see Africa rise, which uh, may inevitably happen, uh, it's going to be when there is, when there is um, a, a kind of a world-affirming work ethic that's combined with the uh, wealth of natural resources. But the world-affirming work ethic that was important for European society was a world-affirming work ethic that also was kind of theocentric. That is, uh, you were working for God. Now, that, that doesn't have to mean you, that you have to be religious to be capitalist. In fact, some of, the, some of the worst capitalists in the world are Christians, but some of them are not. 
And that doesn't mean that capitalism is to be equated with Christianity because capitalism is just a, uh, uh, a way of operating. And it still has to come under, the, uh, under some kind of ethical guidelines. And what happened in America was that the Puritan work ethic produced wealth and the exploitation of resources. But when Puritans got wealthy, they were often as not in later generations the robber barons and the uh, exploiters of workers. So ethics does not necessarily follow development. Ethics does not necessarily follow technological development. It does not necessarily follow uh, economic development. So you can be wealthy and treat people right, or you can be wealthy and treat people bad. And uh, that's the reason why it's important to try to understand the relationship between ethics and, your, uh, and the world, ethics and society. All right, does anybody have a question or comment about any of that? All right, uh, we need to look for just a minute at uh, at the 18th and 19th century with the development of rationalism. The authority of the medieval church was basically undermined by the Reformation. But that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, religious ethics was totally undermined because uh, 18th and 19th century rationalism uh, tended to be in many cases as religious as Reformation ethics or as medieval ethics. But it, as the name implies, it tended to be rationalistic. That is, it, it tended to depend more on reason for the, uh, as the basis for ethical thought and ethical decision. Uh, than on Revelation. And so a great many people who were still fairly religious and went to church all the time uh, downplayed to a certain extent the importance of Revelation. Revelation, according to some of these people, was important for the common person. Even preaching on going to heaven and going to hell might, might be important for the common person. But for the rational person, uh, interestingly enough, from their perspective, for the rational person, through reason you can come you can come to basically the same ethical positions as you get from the Bible. So again, this this was kind of the uh, revival of a of a natural ethic of a natural law. It was also less dependent on the Christian conception of the fall. You remember we talked about Calvin believing that human beings are totally depraved and how that means meant something different. We, we still may not want to agree with it because I don't, I don't agree uh, that uh, Calvin's ethic is, uh, is uh, exactly biblical in some ways. But uh, and so we we may want to critique it in the light of the biblical ethic or in the light of our own ethics. But at the same time, he didn't mean by that that human beings were totally evil and totally corrupt because as a Christian theologian, he had to believe basically or essentially that human beings were essentially good. Because... As we saw in these outlines, if you don't believe that human beings are essentially good, then you don't believe that human beings can be redeemed. Calvin believed that human beings were at a tremendous disadvantage in that they were so far, so far fallen that they could not initiate their own redemption. They could not participate in their own redemption, basically. That their redemption had to come from a 
uh, an act of God. Now, that's still basic to Christian theology. But you can talk about it in different ways, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, for instance, Calvin would have said that sin is necessary. Whereas a modern theologian might say sin is inevitable, but it's not necessary. And Calvin would have said human beings are evil. But a modern theologian would say human beings are essentially good, but they are practically are existentially evil. That's what sin is. And we'll talk about this more next time.